2 Thessalonians chapter 1 today. And last week, last week we looked at verses 1 through 6. And uh, we looked at the, the usual greeting that Paul has for, for these churches that he writes to and his thankfulness for, uh, for them specifically. As I said with the, the first song we sang, it, it could be a model, you know, of the Lord Jesus Christ, of this church here, because of their, their abundance of love they, for they had for one another. And that was reported uh, throughout the many churches in the area around them, uh, their love and their steadfastness even through trials that they were going through. And so we looked at that and uh, we, we looked through uh, verse 6, uh, saying that these, the, the sufferings and the patience and faith that went through, uh, through those sufferings were just a token of the righteous judgment of God. You know, we think of that, think of the righteous judgment of God. Is there a just judge in this earth today? No, but God is a just, is a just God. His opinion, his, his ruling on matters really makes a difference. So it'll be his justice that will recompense those who trouble them then, as it will be at a future time when God will take matters into his own hands for the entire world as well. So why don't we start off today by, by reading chapter 1 of 2 Thessalonians through once again. It's only 12 verses. I only plan on going through verses 7 through 10 today. And I'm saving, because of the, the, the busy weekend next week, I'm saving verses 11 and 12 for next week. You know, because those are an uplifting uh, uplifting verses about thanksgiving, whereas now we're going to be looking at trial and tribulation and the answer for those things. So verse number one says, Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus unto the church of the Thess Thessalonians in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We are bound to thank God always for you. Brethren, as it is meet, because that your faith groweth exceedingly, and the charity of every one of you all toward each other aboundeth, so that we ourselves glory in you in the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure, which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God, that ye may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which ye also suffer, seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. And to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power, when he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe, because our testimony among you was believed in that day. Wherefore also we pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power, that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and ye in him, according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. And Lord, we just pray that you would add your blessing to your word this morning, and we do pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. So we see here at verse seven, you know, on the heels of verse six, that it's righteous for God that he's gonna pay back the trouble that is being inflicted upon them. Just as, as in Romans chapter 14, you know, Paul, uh, Paul quotes that vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I will repay. I mean, everything that's going on today, even with us, our attitude is that God will get you, I won't, amen? We wonder about the things happening today, but don't worry, God will have his say 
as it says a couple verses later, he's going to be coming back. The Lord will be coming back with flaming fire. He's going to be judging the heaven and the earth one day to bring it back according to his purpose. So we start here in verse number seven. This is one of my favorite, one of my many favorite verses. And to you who are troubled, rest with us. What a good place to be, resting in the Lord. Jesus, what are you doing sleeping in the storm? He was resting. He was God after all. He was in control of the storms. How can us as believers exercise self-control and exercise discipline, exercise faith in the current situations that we're in in the world? Well, the current situations, if you listen to everything that's on the radio and on the TV, you would think we're going to have the worst climatic situation ever. God is, I mean, man is causing this earth to go into, into decay. Cows in the field are adding methane, and that's making the planet be overcome by CO2 and the like. Man is the problem. That part I would agree with. But it's not man and his actions with the earth. It's man and his actions with God. Man who has rejected God and his holiness in favor of pumping up themselves. I would agree with that. God is going to be bring, bring in judgment. And you who are troubled, Thessalonians were troubled. They were troubled by the, the, the Jews that, that, that persecuted them. They were in trouble by their own people because of their faith in Christ. After all, that would put a real dent in idolatry when you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. It does the same thing with us, rest. How do we rest? This part I didn't have prepared. How do we rest? We rest in hope. We, we rest in the confident assurance that, that heaven is our home. This earth is not our home. We're just passing through. I'm so glad we played that song today. It was a reminder. I'm just passing through. Flat tires will be a thing of the past. Cars not starting will be a thing of the past. Climate change will be a thing of the past. Rest with us. The trials they were faced with as the critics and those false teachers, as we'll see in chapter 2, were saying that the rapture or the day of Christ had already taken place. Paul says, that's not so. Rest with us. When? Well, well let's, go, let's go over to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. I know you're thinking to yourself, this is another one of your favorite verses too. <laughs> let's, go to, let's start with verse number 15. For all things are for your sakes, that the abundant gra grace might through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God. You know, I love that term, redound. Sounds like rebound. Has any, have you, anybody ever played basketball where you purposely miss the shot so you can get the rebound and get the extra point then? You got a rebound. The, 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 it goes right where it was planned to go. You know, God's plan of prophecy goes exactly like he planned it. And, and, and what happens is this is exactly, he knew what exactly was going to happen to Paul in the persecutions and sufferings. And also, Paul knew exactly what would happen to the Corinthians. They would be overcome by false teachers that were trying to show them another way, trying to, trying to usurp 
what was already laid down by them. So for all things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God. You know, by grace you stand. By grace you live, by grace you stand. That grace will always triumph over anything else. Verse number 16, for which cause we faint not. Amen, we don't get dismayed. We faint not. In the heat, I feel like fainting sometimes. But yet, through the trials and everything, we faint not. But though our outward man perish, perishing every day, even with Botox, plastic surgery, you can go through umpteen uh, surgeries to improve. You can now become, I ran into a guy that just had his, his elbow replaced. He's had his, his both knees, his hip, his one shoulder, and he had his, his elbow all mechanical. I said, boy, Jim, you're like the $6 million man. It says you've been all put together by bolts and screws. But that $6 million, I think we need to adjust that $6 million for inflation today. So it's probably 20 times or 100 times more than that. He would be $6 billion if you paid for him you know, privately. But if it were a government job, it would cost 10 times that amount. So, but the reality is the outward man is perishing. I told him his son is a Christian. He was right there. I said, you know, you know, Jim, you're, the outward man is still perishing. There's not too many screws left in the world that can hold it together. So the answer is to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And of course, his son stayed there and he, he kind of started boogieing up the stairs with his walker. He just still doesn't want to hear that. No matter what, it's amazing. We know the outward man is perishing. I know I don't have to have the mirror tell me every day. I don't have to step up to it and go, ah, every day. I know the Bible says it. The outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. The outward old man, the old man is dead. The flesh we carry is perishing each and every day. Otherwise, we, we wouldn't need stuff like glasses and hearing aids and Die if you dye your hair, all these different things. But look at verse 17. Now you'll, you'll recognize this is one of my favorite verses. For our light affliction. You know, sometimes we think things are so bad that we're going through something awful. We can go through other places in the world that are going through severe trials. But compared to that time when when, when God brings his judgment to earth, it, it's nothing compared to what will happen then. No matter what we go through is light affliction. No matter how bad we feel, compared with the terror of God during the tribulation time, it's nothing. Because all, people all like to use the expression, all hell is breaking loose. But during the tribulation period, all heaven's breaking loose when God brings his judgment to this earth. And he's the righteous judge, right? He can do it. Mankind has so much sinned that it's brought a stink up to his nose, just like the building of Babel was brought up to him. The, 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 the torment, the, the, the smell went up to God's nose and and he could, he could see that. So he judged the world then. Of course, man didn't learn a lesson. God judged the world during the flood. Mankind still didn't, leave, uh, didn't, didn't learn the lesson. Hence, so on and so forth, we keep on going. Today, the next moment, after the, the rapture of the church, God will be bringing his judgment. And you, you know what? God's mankind in general will still not believe. They'll be crying in Revelation chapter 6. They'll be crying for the rocks to fall down on them. They'd rather have that than, than believing. 
in the God that's bringing that judgment, that he's just for our light affliction, which is but for a moment. How fast is our life here on earth? Like that. I can't do it, but there we go. <laughs> Snap. Our life here, whether we live to 60, 70, 80, 90, or 100. Bob Barker yesterday, 99 years old. I can't picture getting to 69 years old anymore. Never mind 99, but never mind. <laughs> Just a snap. A thousand years with the Lord. What day with the Lord is a thousand years and a thousand years is the day. 99 insignificant years in God's eyes. Unless he had believed in the gospel before, but I don't know. But yet, this long time that we feel on earth is but a blip. I won't try to snap my fingers once again. It's but a snap. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment. Sometimes we just get feeling, that toothache feeling that won't go away. It feels like it goes away, it sticks with you for hours and days, but it's but for a moment. This pain and suffering that we have today will be gone. Gone for how long? Between your next now and the next doctor's appointment? I felt pretty good after my last chiropractor appointment. I still feel pretty good, but only pretty good. But when the Lord Jesus Christ takes his body, takes his church out, out with it go all the pain and suffering for us. That's why it's important to look at the context in First Thessalonians or Second Thessalonians 1 7. Rest with us. That's a position that the church has in Christ Jesus. Let me go, I get ahead of myself there. Back to back to 2 Corinthians 4. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. I love that, that, that phraseology there. The weight of glory. The word glory itself is sometimes uh, taken from a word meaning weight. You know, that's why the priests in the temple, when they were dedicating Solomon's temple, they fell because of the weight of glory. By the way, there are those that say that's for us today. Nonsense. The, the weight of glory was so much that they couldn't even stand to minister. We don't have that where it'll knock us down and knock us out, but we have this weight of glory that gives us hope for eternity. Verse number 15, or 18 rather, while we look not at the things which are seen. If you look at the things which are seen, no matter what, while you're driving down the road, you know, one of the things I like about not driving sometime I've, I've seen things that I've never seen before because when you're driving, I hope your eyes are on the road. But when, when you see these things in your everyday life, and it's not a very good picture, is it? Man, we see, we see car wrecks on the road. We see all kinds of different things. The things which are, uh, while well, we look not at the things which are seen, oh, this is no... Uh, uh, this is not a recommendation to drive with your eyes closed. <laughs> but at the things which are not seen, do we see Jesus? Is Jesus going to walk into that, that back door here and visit? No. Where is Jesus now? Where are we spiritually now? We're with him in heavenly places. That's the position we're at. The things that here on earth don't really matter. They don't add a, a hundred years of life can add up to a tiny little anthill in the eyes of God, if that much even. 
For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal, which brings us back to our text. And to you who are troubled, rest with us. Our rest is upon the Lord. Amen? Rest. Now, the next part of it says, a lot of people look at it saying, well, we can rest when the second part happens. Let's look at this for a second. And to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. Your position is resting already when Jesus comes with his mighty angels. Because he's coming to do what? He's coming to kick the daylight out of the Antichrist and, and, his, and his cohorts. He's coming to bring judgment on the earth. We are, uh, the, the Thessalonians are being told they're already in that rest. So don't pay attention to those who are described in chapter 2, that those that were saying that these things are already happening. Because the end time events, when the Antichrist comes, we don't have to worry about it. There's a lot of conferences, scholars looking for the Antichrist. I'd like to, I wish I put a pin the tail on the, the Antichrist sticker up here and and had everybody come up with a blindfold and say, and pin the tail on the Antichrist. People have been doing ever since I was saved, and it never struck me uh, that much. They've been trying to look for the Antichrist. Those on the earth will be looking for the Antichrist, but we'll be in heaven. We won't be looking for the Antichrist. Neither today. I've seen more theories about the Antichrist, and I'll call them theories. Whole books about the Antichrist. Who or what is the Antichrist? The Antichrist is New York City. New York City. The letters and the equal distance lettering and the Sumerian numbering of the letters, New York City adds up to 666. That's the number of the beast. That's nothing to do with New York City. You know, and another one was George W. Bush is another antichrist. If you take the W out of it, it totally throws that, that philosophy out the window. So many people have been playing games with and selling books and, and becoming very popular with trying to pin things down and throwing stuff at, at, at events happening in the world. What ever happened to Ukraine? Is that still a, an issue nowadays? I don't even know. That was supposed to be such a great prophetic event that that was going to usher in Gog and Magog. I don't pay attention to what all the news on TV. I think it was Jenny posted, how come there's not a Florida or a Hawaii thing on Facebook? I support Ukraine. I support the nightclub incident in Florida. But there's nothing for Hawaii with it. Multiple people have been killed in the fires there. Who makes up these things? Who cares? <laughs> right? And to you who are troubled, rest with us. They, they will be in their place of rest when the Lord Jesus will be revealed. Revealed is apocalypso, the apocalypse, the revelation of Jesus Christ on this earth from heaven with his mighty angels. It's when his feet will literally touch down. He'll, he'll be on this earth, coming down and instantly, chapter two, instantly destroying the Antichrist and his cohorts. Verse number eight. All right, actually, let's go to Romans eight for a second. I wanna go visit Romans eight a couple times. Romans eight. Verse 17. So 
Then we're going to go back to Romans 8 in a little bit too. So. <clears throat> I want to go back to I want to go back to verse, I said verse 17. Let's go back to verse 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that, we suffer with him that we may be also glorified together. For I reckon, I love that, for I reckon, add it up, count that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared which, with the glory which shall be revealed in us. I'm going to end right there and go back to verse number 19 in a little bit. But let's go back to our text in, in 1 Thessalonians. Oh, 2 Thessalonians, I'm sorry. So our, our position at the time of, this, of the great tribulation was, will be resting with the Lord will be in those heavenly places during the great tribulation. Verse number eight, in flaming fire, taking vengeance, vengeance on them that know not God. What is so amazing, throughout the ages, there has been so much opportunity for the world, for people to know God. Creation. Psalm 90. The heavens declare the glory of God. Romans chapter 1. I'd love to go through the whole verse, but that would take a couple weeks probably, at least. They'll see the attributes of God but still reject God. So God gives them up to their own thoughts, their own deeds. God has been long suffering, but one time, one day, only he knows when this age we're in is gonna come, when the day of the Lord will take place. But what about those that knew or know not God? Verse number eight, and again, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that they obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. The gospel is the most important thing there is in the world. The gospel is the thing which sets people free, yet it's the gospel that's treated as hate speech today. It's amazing how people will accept anything except the gospel, the good news. Let's go up, uh, let's go up to chapter 1 for a second. Chapter 1, verse number 10. Oh, I am in chapter 1. Oh, all right, yeah, I'm just, I'm looking at my, my notes, looking at the next verse, so we'll, we'll be there in a minute, so. It's, yeah, uh, verse number eight, still. Sorry, got lost for a second. In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, verse nine. 
who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and the glory of his power. This is what happens. Let's go back to the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 3. Here we go. I'm, I'm back on track, I think. Genesis chapter 3. Verse number 8. I was going to skip down to the, uh, near the end of the, the chapter. I don't know if I'll do that, though. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. This is they or is Adam and Eve. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told thee that thou wast naked, that thou eat it, uh, Thou eaten of the tree, whereof I commanded thee, that thou shouldest not eat. It's like the one command they had to do was not to eat of the tree of the garden. How simple was that? But of course, of course, Eve is the one that, that partook first and Adam partook after. <laughs> it's a strong agreement there. <laughs> But something so simple. The only man and woman in existence couldn't follow the simple command of God. You should eat of any other tree that is in the garden except for this one. And they ate of it and discovered that they were naked. And what did they do? They did like everybody else in the world after. They sang, hiding from thee. Right? They hid from God. Now, I think what they lost when, in disobeying God was much more than what we think of today. You know, I, you think of Adam being the first Adam, the first creation of God. He more than likely was clothed in, in something spectacular, kind of like what we'll, we'll see you know, after the rapture, with new bodies. He had that new body then. It was old. And he lost it all because he disobeyed the Lord. Verse number 11. And he said, Who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? Now, mind you, God knew exactly what was going to happen. He knew what Adam had done, but yet he's getting this right from the horse's mouth, so to speak. And the man said, like all men do, the woman whom thou gavest, gaveth to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the woman, what is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, the serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. That's one of the most tragic things. <clears throat> Don't listen to anybody else, but she listened to the serpent. There's many serpents still around today who are beguiling people into believing something else. That serpent got off of, uh, well, he was on his two or four legs at this time, and he was, he was relegated to crawling on his belly. Today, 2 Corinthians chapter 11 says that, that the messengers of Satan, they come as angels of light. All good stuff, preaching peace and, and love and prosperity, teaching things that, ooh, I just tickled my own ear, I was, teaching things that, that go against God, that are, that are, that are be, uh, that are that are making that are sounding good to the people hearing, rather than teaching the truth. Don't eat from that tree. 
And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field, upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. A little side note here. God said he was cursed above all cattle. That's pretty cursed, because what became the symbol of much idolatry after cattle they still have the sacred cows in India, right? The cattle, the, the, one of the symbols of Moloch is, is a cow. What did Aaron make for the people? They made a golden calf. So Satan, Satan was a cursed, cursed above all cattle. So what would Satan work with? He'd settle with the next best thing. Cattle itself. He was cursed already. And I will and I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. We look at this as the proto evangel I can't even pronounce it. The the proto gospel. This was a, a reference to the future deliverance where Jesus Christ would be crucified. The head, of, the head would be bruised and uh, the head, would, uh, the head of, of the serpent would be bruised and thou shalt bruise his heel. He was crucified. Bruised through the heel. He was there. He, he went to the cross and, and Satan is still wounded but still very active and powerful and works through many people today. Verse number 16, I forgot where I was gonna stop here. Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. And Adam, and unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. And mind you, that ground is still cursed until the second Adam returns, when he comes to restore everything. And I'll make a point I was going to make after, much of, much of Christianity says the, the purpose of God is the salvation of souls. That's part of the purpose of God. The purpose of God is to restore all things. So if you read the end of the book, Revelation chapter 22, it lines up with the Garden of Eden in Genesis chapter 3, or chapter 2 rather. It lines up perfectly because there's new heaven and a new earth, or new heavens and new earth that will, be, that will be put into place. I'm getting ahead of myself, I'll go back. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground, for out of it was, wast thou taken. For dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. And Adam called his wife's name Eve, because she was mother of all living. Unto Adam also, and to his wife, did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man is become as one of us, to know good and evil, and now lest he put forth his hand, and take also of the tree of life, and eat, and live forever. Guess where the tree of life shows up once again? It shows up in the book of Revelation. The early part of Revelation, and at the end, it says the tree of life. Have access through the tree of life through endurance. Now that's a judgment. We don't have to have access to the tree of life through our endurance and tribulation or anything else. We have access to God Himself. That's that's a that's an amazing thing right there. Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove, all that to get to the last verse here. 
So he drove out the man, and he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword, which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. Adam, through his sin, separate, uh, uh, suffered separation from God. That's what sin has done with all of us. Sin has separated us from God. And the only answer to that is his answer, the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's go to, uh, let's go to Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2. Verse number 11, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to how many people? To all men, right? There's no man on this earth that has an excuse. The grace of God has appeared to all men. Say, what about that person in Borneo that lived? That's a straw man argument. Don't even argue that. That's what people will do. Well, what if I'm on a desert island in the middle of the Pacific and I don't have the Bible? Said, you're not on a desert island in the middle of the Pacific. You're right here. Right? So those arguments, those, they're straw man arguments that'll be used. The grace of a God, God hath appeared to all men. And what does that grace of God Oh, you guys are all about grace. You can do anything you want. You, that's cheap grace that you're talking about, isn't it? It's cheap for us, but not to God. Amen? Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, even with all the afflictions, even with the trials. This is our, what we should be doing. What's our motivation to do that? The same motivation the Thessalonians had, that somebody tried to, tried to change them around. Looking. Looking for who? Looking for what? Looking for the Antichrist? Looking for the next sign that's going to appear out of heaven? Remember, signs are for the Jews. The Jews require a sign. The Greeks require wisdom. Well, here's some wisdom right there. Looking for that blessed hope. Right? We're looking for that blessed hope. What is that blessed hope? It's Jesus Christ. Appearing. Not appearing in judgment coming to earth, but calling in the rapture. In 1 Thessalonians 14, for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity. Yes, indeed, it's true. We're all dirty. We all have iniquity. He forgave us instantly of all that in iniquity at the cross. When we accepted the gospel, we're forgiven of all sins. He's not imputing those sins unto us any longer. But yet, why? Why should we then try to live holy? I should, I should take out try. It's impossible for you to do it. It's impossible for us to live holy unless we look to the author of holiness if we look to the gospel, that's what motivates us to do these things. Who gave himself that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people. I love that. I've been called peculiar a few times for different reasons. A peculiar people, different from everybody else. Zealous of good works. 
What are those good works? I can't name them. We all have different good works in our lives. The idea about being zealous for good works is that there are other people needing to be saved, needing to hear the gospel from you. Imagine if we didn't have the works. Imagine if we didn't have our, our, our speech seasoned with salt and our approach was one of nastiness. Can you think of that? Some people are so nasty, they're right about everything, but they're nasty. Amen? Did you ever run into those people? Ah, yelling all the time, you need to be saved! I can still, I can still remember Helen's grandmother one time. She wasn't nasty, but it was, uh, she was talking, that this is a reverse one. This is reverse in, in its scope. I came home, I'm taking off my shoes and her grandmother while she was still alive. They were talking about church, which can be a very dangerous subject to talk about with certain people. And Helen was explaining, I, I was listening to it, she was explaining how, how in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, says, says, by grace are you saved, and that through faith. Uh, it's a gift of God. And all of a sudden I heard her grandmother say, that is blasphemy! I was like, wow, I didn't know she could still yell that loud. And I went running out and I went, are you calling the Apostle Paul a blasphemer? He said, I don't care who wrote that, it's blasphemy, because that's not what the church teaches. Sadly, there are people like that that will treat the Bible the same way. It says right here, you must be saved if you're not saved. I'm like, shut up. <laughs> there are those people that are like that. Will hold, hold your feet over, over the fires of hell and force a profession of faith. I know I've been there, done that. I've told people before I believe that I believe just to get them off my back. Right? We know people like that. That's why, that's why we should heed these words in, in Titus. Let's go back to uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter number 1. Verse number 10, in closing, when he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe, because our testimony unto you was believed in that day. Think of it, the Thessalonians seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. When Christ returns, I like the, the wording here, it says, come to be glorified in his saints. Glorified in those who believed. Though by, by, by Christians, as well as those saints we see in, in Revelation chapter 7, those, those that have gone through the tribulation, they have their white robes on and they're, they're doing, uh, what's the day before? The, they're doing Palm Sunday right there, and they're being glorified by those people that believed him through the tribulation, and they'll also, he'll also be glorified by those people in heaven as well. Now, where the two come together, I don't know. I think maybe in the, Jer in Jeru in the New Jerusalem, when all things will become one, when the whole earth is restored. Let's go back to Romans 8, like... Like I said, Romans chapter 8. I said I was going back here to this spot here. Well, segue, we went through verse 18 before. Let me start with verse 18. 
and read through verse, verse 25. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. This is the, the, uh, the expectations of the creature, waiteth for the man, uh, manifestation of the God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption unto the glorious liberty of the children of God. Now look at verse number 22. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together, uh, together until now. The whole world which has been under the curse, the curse will be lifted. I remember the Red Sox when they won the 2004 World Series. It was called The Curse Was Lifted. The curse of trading Babe, Babe Ruth to the Yankees way back when. That made such big news. But the entire earth, the entire cre creation is, is waiting. Uh, it's it's going to be redeemed. And not only though, verse number 23, and not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of the body. I'm groaning and waiting and waiting and groaning. That rapture couldn't happen fast enough. And that's why we have the hope of the rapture that the things that came up in the verses before won't be for us. It'll be for the people described in chapter 2 of 2 Thessalonians. Verse number 24. For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for it? But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. Paul, I'm sure he taught the same thing to the Thessalonians. Just wait. The rapture is going to happen. But here's the signs of the second coming. I'm going to give those to you that you may rest in this day and to be with the Lord when all that takes place. Today we're in the greatest time of rest we could ever be in. Amen? Think of that. Turmoil. All kinds of things happening in the world, but we can rest in Christ Jesus, knowing that we won't be going through the great tribulation. Will we go through tribulation? Sure. Will we go through trials? Sure. Those are guaranteed. Let's turn to the, the book of Isaiah. I stayed closing, didn't I? But a couple more verses. Isaiah 65. Gonna get the right place here. I'm just gonna take a couple verses out of the the couple of chapters of, of, of Isaiah. Isaiah 65, verse number 17. It says, For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered nor come into mind. There is the expectation of a new earth when God judges the old. Isaiah chapter 66.
Verse number 22. For as the new heavens and the new earth, which I will make, shall remain before me, saith the Lord, so shall your seed and your name remain. It's the everlasting kingdom. Second Peter chapter number two, and I, I'm not doing any service by just reading one verse out of Isaiah 65 and 66, but put it this way, chapters 40 through 66 have nothing at all to do with us. It all has to do with Israel and prophecy. We'll be partaking in that, that new heavens and new earth, but the actual culmination of it we won't face. Second Peter chapter three. It's one place I read some of this last week. Second Peter chapter three. Let's go to verse, uh, well, we might as well go, let's go. Uh, Let's go to verse uh, 6. Whereby the world, what's the whereby there for? Yeah, I'm going to go back, back further, but let's, let's, let's start in 6 here, just to finish up here. Whereby the world that then was, being overflowed with water, perished, but the heavens and earth, which are now, by the same word are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Those that would, would usurp the, the, the word of the will of God. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should, should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But... The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heaven shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. One question that, that I have, will Alexandra Ocasio, whatever her name is, will she be part of this verse with all the climate change and everything? Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in all holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat? Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness." Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent that ye may be found of him in peace without spot and blameless. So we see this new heaven and new earth that will, will take place. It's coming. Soon and very soon we are going to see the king. One last place. Ephesians chapter 2, right after my favorite verse. Ephesians 2, verse 7. That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. I think those ages to come are during that tribulation period when we can rest as the Thessalonians, rest with him away from his judgments. Amen? And I have to go to verse 8. For by grace are ye saved 
through faith and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not, a, not of works, lest any man should boast. <coughs> Trying to get back to, uh, back to Second Thessalonians for the closing. Is this the closing of the closing or the closing of the closing of the closing? Yes, <laughs> yes there we go. Let's wrap it all up together. Second Thessalonians chapter seven, I mean uh, chapter one, verse seven says, "Then to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his holy angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. We see this judgment coming, but those who are saved have rest with the Lord who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power when he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe because our testimony among you was believed in that day. And I want to sneak into verse 10 before I start on it next week. It says, Wherefore also we pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and ye in him according to the grace of our, our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. See, they, they were saved and their calling was a calling to suffer with Christ. They had, actually, they had actually gone along with that calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness through that calling. Some people will talk about the calling being the effectual calling of salvation. That We don't know exactly what that means, but you know what the calling of salvation is? Jesus Christ died, was buried, and rose again in fulfillment of the scriptures, if you believe this and trust it, according to Ephesians chapter 14, you'll have, you'll have salvation. That'll be receiving the gift of God. There, that's the calling right there. You hear the calling, you believe it in that sense. Amen? Those of us here, we have heard the, we've heard the calling. We believe. Now we just grow in that belief. Amen?